how so who found out about Bernstein because you wouldn't have um you wouldn't have heard Berns, Berns, Bernstein's name at the yeah. hospital, right? I mean they didn't right. know about Bernstein or Bernstein's sort of management strategies, right? So it's it's about it. It's really interesting the the misinformation that you're given when your son or your daughter are diagnosed is immediate. And I'll give you just one example. We can go on and on. The first uh, thing that you're taught when your child is diagnosed, and Dave was diagnosed in a severe state of DKA, DKA. he was near death. Uh, it's an awful story. Um, but when, when he was diagnosed, you're taught carb counting. Mm. <laughs> and uh, you think, well, you know, like, why, uh, why are, why are we following carb counting? So you initially question the method perhaps because you, you can learn about the dangers of high blood sugar right away. And it's never taught that, it's never taught that, um, for example, protein foods require insulin, which is like a known well-known physiologic fact, right? We, we, everybody knows why you, and we can get to that later, but the main point is if you don't know that, you think the following logic, the kids need carbohydrate because they need insulin. So we have to feed carbohydrate. Not only is it the food pyramid recommendation and the kids are at cardiometabolic risk because they're a type one, but they need insulin to grow. So I, I need to provoke the need for insulin by feeding my child carbohydrate. So you, you, that's a myth. So you, but you immediately get wrapped around myths like that. And you get, you get thrown into that world. And, um, so we, we let, we, we left the hospital and we tried for a month to follow along with these guidelines. And, um, I, as a physicist, try to exactly match the carbohydrate with the insulin. And th this is the other thing uh, about carb counting that they don't teach you. They don't teach you that it's impossible to match fast-acting carbohydrate injections with fast-acting insulin with, with rapid-acting carbohydrate. You can't, why would you, why would you even expect that you could match those two things with the variability in digestion? It's like, uh, it's like pulling a slot machine handle and expecting to win. Um, there's too much variation in the system. Mm -hmm. And the fact that nobody can do it is a clue that, that it doesn't work. But the takeaway by the, the care providers and the, 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 the doctors is that, well, your, your ratios are off or you're just not very good at it. And, and, uh, uh, but they all believe that the method works, even though there's no examples in their own practices or in the literature where it works. Well, we, we figured that out right away. Uh, in a couple of weeks, I figured out using, you know, taking data and trying this exact same meal and seeing this variation in results. Uh, and I also learned that the elevated blood sugars are, uh, a real, a real problem. So, uh, you know, the, the sad thing now about the medical community is that they're, instead of teaching people that, that this carb counting doesn't work, they're sticking with the carb counting and then they're inflating the range that they call a uh, time and range. And they're giving people a, a false sense of security about the blood sugars. Uh, so it's, it's really, it's diabolical what's happening, but we didn't fall for it. And, um, it, you know, during the month or so, when I, I sort of proved that this couldn't be done, um, my wife got, as you mentioned earlier, she, she ordered the Bernstein book and I went back once and, and looked, when did we order that book? And it was a month after diagnosis, she ordered the book. And, uh, uh, you know, apologies uh, if you've heard this story before, but damn it, I've got that book. I opened it up and started reading it, and I just knew that we had found the solution to the problem. And it was like, uh, you know, 
I, it's like, I, I feel like I'm in therapy every time I talk about that because that was such a traumatic thing to see your child go through and then to find the solution to it. Um, it was like a remarkable experience. Uh, one of the most, and it, of course, once you start doing it, there's like an instant improvement. It doesn't take months for the system to sort of break in or something like that. Um, the closer you follow along with it, the faster you're going to get, um, you know, we were doing things like, uh, we were seeing blood sugars. Like I remember, uh, seeing a blood sugar of 270, 280, and then you would check and then it'd be 320. And then you would try to give insulin and then, uh, it would be back down to 120 and you'd be like, Oh my God. Right. And then you would check 10 minutes later and it'd be 65. And what a, like, this is before CGMs too. I mean, what a nightmare that experience is. And then if you switch to, you know, bacon and eggs, um, you know, oh, he's 120. Oh, okay. You know, oh, he's 72. Okay. Um, I've lived that experience, sad experience for decades, for decades. I've lived that for decades. And uh, yeah. I thought I was to blame because I wasn't being smart enough. In fact, I was told that I wasn't being smart enough with my palm, that I should pre-bolus or I should try yeah. different ratios. Pre-bolus, yeah, uh, it doesn't work. Or pre-bolus or, or maybe, oh, not 15 minutes, or maybe I should pre-bolus 20 minutes earlier. And no one ever told me, don't eat that freaking pizza. I mean, I would have been happy right. not to eat it. I would have been more than, uh, you know, happy not to ever touch bread, but no one ever told me. And yeah. I kept it trying seems... and trying and counting carbohydrates and trying that futile sort of uh, mission of trying to match insulin to the conversion of your food into glucose. I mean, how do you even match that? That is an impossible task. Right. I think I had my light bulb moment when I heard that very, very statement from... Yes. Uh, from one of Bernstein's early, early videos where he yes. clearly said it is a very it difficult, like in fact, it's almost okay. an impossible task to match those two sort of curves, if you like. And then I just thought, this is it. There's nothing wrong with me or my efforts. I'm not a failure. <laughs> it's just yes. what I've been taught is not. Yeah. Is they, tell, yeah. they tell um, the care providers to give the diabetics this huge range, uh, the time and range is now, uh, we'll talk about that because there's news on that. There's a range which is, they allow up to 180 and then 30% of the time you can be above that. And one of the reasons they give is because you don't want to make people feel like a failure. Yet they force the same strategy on everybody, which doesn't work at all. It is a mathematically guaranteed strategy which will fail uh it, it 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 just it defies comprehension that this vast industry of people would force people like you and my son to follow a, a protocol which is so failed um uh and then be uh totally uninterested in an alternative method which yields unprecedented glycemic results and improvement in quality of life and the trick to doing so is to use insulin in a safer way mm -hmm. and essentially get rid of processed junk food those are the two things that you're that really are you know uh because people aren't just like giving up sweet potatoes, okay? What you have to do to, to convert the Bernstein protocol is to give up all the addictive, obesogenic, industrial processed foods that, that people are addicted to. And if you can do that, you're, you're home free. So why would there be so much pushback from this diabolical diabetes industry to giving up junk food and using insulin in a safer way to achieve results, which move you from being in a situation where you're going to die early 
with significant agony when your blood sugar's up here to living a long, healthy life down here. Uh, you would think, like, we, we published this paper with this group from Type 1 Grit. You would, and it got coverage in the New York Times. You would think that the entire diabetes industry would stop. They would uh, in, invite people who participated in the study to, to frequently talk at their conferences that, uh, you know, on and on and on. Instead, uh, it's the reaction is the opposite. You are, if you are a low carb type one diabetic, you're persona non grata in the diabetes industry community. And that's what I call it. They don't want to have any of their paid diabetes advocates be low carb. They don't have any uh, physicians who are interested in it. There's no follow-up research on it. Uh, instead, they, they are concerned with uh, giving each other awards, uh, showing that their, that their equipment can lower A1C by like 0.3% or some uh, garbage result like that. Um, uh, you know, uh, worrying, uh, uh, oh, bragging about their, their new loops. Uh, and if you read the fine print, the loops are, are well, the, the loop is a great thing, okay? But your glycemic results without changing your, your diet on the loop are, are still a big problem. It's still the food. And yet everyone ignores the fact that it's the food. And as a physicist, how could you how could you do that? That's the main governor of the whole system is how fast your your food turns into glucose. Yeah, I completely, completely sympathize with <laughs> it, uh, you know, that you just said. Um, if they were here with us right now, what do you think they would say to that? I mean, what's the, what could you possibly say to that argument? I think we have to look at, uh, I mean, they can't argue it. There's just, they, they can't, they can't possibly argue it, but I think we have to look at, you know, who's, well, they would say, who's funding, sometimes they who's say funding like, the ADA and who's funding our Diabetes UK, which is, you know, our, our equivalent of the American ADA, right? The Diabetes UK. I think they try to make the argument that there's no, oh, we need to have more studies, but there's no good studies that show their methods work. So that's no. one thing. And then they they rely on uh, then they start saying weird things like um, well if you get rid of all that processed obesogenic junk food which we know is responsible for you know all the type two diabetes in the world and in fact we see now type two diabetes amongst all the type one kids and we know that the the child obesity rates are off the chart and they're worse with the type ones but they say if you remove that addictive processed food, which we now know is a main chief source of, of eating disorders. And they say, if you remove that food, you're going to cause an eating disorder. And I say, if you're, if you're, if you think removing the junk food is going to cause you a disorder, it might be that the disorder is upon you already. Because once you, once you get rid of that food, it's like breaking an addiction. We don't tell people who smoke that you need to keep smoking or else you'll get addicted to smoking. And we don't tell people who are drinking too much that they need to keep drinking a bit here and there or else they'll 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 get become an alcoholic. It's nonsense. So you can't tell someone who's a, a diabetic, uh, uh, you know, a type two diabetic or someone with weight problems or someone who's being negatively affected by this processed food that they should keep eating it. Uh, when we know when we know that it's driving disorders, so the whole the, they don't really have any arguments anymore. Now I'll tell you one thing: I, I've been watching. Um, we're talking about time and range. We were, I watched a conference via Twitter this weekend, and I saw something very interesting because when this time and range stuff came out, uh, they allow up to one eighty. If you go into the one eighty the... ten for uh, for people using our UK menu. yes. 10 millimoles. Yes. So 180 or 10, that's, that's a, that's a range. And they try to convince you that's a safe range. So that means like, if you're a parent and your child is sleeping and they go to bed, it's 11 o'clock and you check on them and they're 160, let's say they're in range. Well, that range is double normal. And if you read literature, and I'm not talking about Dr. Bernstein's literature, I'm talking about ADA published literature. You read about the dangers of those blood sugars 
there are microvascular dangers and there are macrovascular dangers. You don't get a free pass to health by running a blood sugar, which is double normal and 30% above that. And they are starting to recognize that. So now they've got a new phrase that they trotted out this weekend. I'd never heard it before. I don't know who is responsible for it. It's called time in tighter range. And mm -hmm. now they're defining that as up to 140. And there's, you read the papers that they're talking about. There's little sentences here and there that, yeah, you know, you got to be careful of, you know, because non-diabetics are not running uh, over 140. They have some, some references and so on. Uh, so I thought, well, we should have a new phrase called time in normal range, which is like, I don't know, let's say it's, let's say it's 75 to hundred. Okay. That's a pretty reasonable range. If you're, if you're following the Bernstein method and you're up above 110, depends on the context, but you're likely to, uh, if you're really good at it, you're likely to correct that 110. You're not going to be walking around at 110. And if you're rising at 110, you're going to go, okay, I might be 120 in a half an hour. So I'm going to take a half a unit of insulin. And that's, that's the control the Bernstein method provides for you. But they, they can never give people advice like that who are following their same advice to eat all the birthday cake they want and, and so on. Because if you do that, uh, you know, 110 is as good as it's going to get, right? So anyway, that's the new thing, time and tighter range. You're going to hear, you're going to hear more about that, you know, and they're going to say, then they're going to throw their hands up and say, well, you know, like we, we, time and range is sort of reasonable and, you know, uh, but, uh, we, you know, we do tell people if you can get in time and tighter range, that's a good thing. And it's like, okay, at some point you have to tell people how to do that, right? Let's get curious about how other people are doing it. And the lack of curiosity is what I'm talking about. Why are these people so incurious and so quick to write off um, this, this method? And it's like, what I mean, what do these people do in, in their like normal lives when do they, they constantly like hit their heads against the wall and anything in their life that doesn't work do they do they not respond to any any stimulus the, uh that could you know change things in a positive direction i mean I, you know it's like the whole thing is so bizarre right i say you know diabetes like once we got the book i kind of figured out diabetes in about two weeks but the real bizarre problem is trying to understand this industry that keeps insisting it from my vantage point on on sending people down the tubes over and over again um in fact if you follow as you know if you follow this method you're likely to get harassed and threatened by your care team uh you know it, it's a it's a fact uh people will get fired for eating healthy meals of protein foods and vegetables using safe dosing of insulin and achieving glycemic results that no other patient in the practices shoot for. And from for that, you'll get harassed, threatened, and maybe fired by your care provider. It's just unbelievable.